Divine Mercy Novena for the third day. Today bring to me all devout and faithful souls. It's the fourth, fourth day of the Novena. Today bring to me those who do not believe in God and those who do not yet know me. I was thinking also of them during my bitter passion and their future zeal comforted my heart. Immerse them in the ocean of my mercy. Most compassionate Jesus, you are the light of the world. Receive into the abode of your most compassionate heart the souls of those who do not believe in God and of those who as yet do not know you. Let the rays of your grace enlighten them that they too, together with us, may extol your wonderful mercy and do not let them escape from the abode which is your most compassionate heart. Eternal Father, turn your merciful gaze upon the souls of those who do not believe in you and of those who as yet do not know you, but who are enclosed in the most compassionate heart of Jesus. Draw them to the light of the gospel. These souls do not know what great happiness it is to love you. Grant that they too may extol the generosity of your mercy. For endless ages, amen. This Easter season, and really every Easter season, the primary virtue, and you can be seated. The primary virtue that is emphasized is faith. And the root or the primary act of faith is belief. What does it mean to believe? Believe is different than um, opinion or knowledge. Belief, like, for example, scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge, we know it has to be um, uh, encountered by the senses in some way. We have to see it, smell it, taste it, so that it can be measured, and we can kind of draw conclusions and come up with knowledge based on how we have observed scientifically the external world. And that's how knowledge comes about from a scientific standpoint. But with faith and the exercise of belief, belief has more to do with believing what someone tells us. Someone tells me that, hey, there's a great restaurant, like I just moved to town, there's a great restaurant, you know, a couple miles down the road. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but this person seems trustworthy, I'm, I'm going to believe them, I'm going I'm to do that. that. That you can see where faith comes into play in terms of being able to um, believe someone and you believe someone because they are trustworthy. They seem to be trustworthy at least. And so faith is at the core of this Easter season because faith of the apostles and disciples of Jesus is front and center in regards to the Paschal mystery. For example, when Jesus died on the cross, the apostles and disciples thought it was over. He's done. You know, they were scant. They, and, it, and Jesus was so brutalized in his passion that they were scandalized by that. They thought, we're done. You know, Peter, and John, you know, it's Let's go get, get, get the boat ready, right? Let's go back and get ready to start our business. This, the Jesus thing is over. We've got to find something else to do. It was good while it lasted. And so on the day of resurrection, they were shocked. And this is all in Scripture, by the way. This is not me offering my own take. This is written in Scripture. If you go read the account of the resurrection, you find that the apostles and disciples were full of disbelief. And it's, it's because, it, you know, they, they couldn't grasp that he was coming back. Even though Jesus told them, 
at least three times that he was going to die and come back to life. He told him, look, this is what's going to happen. And remember that one time that Jesus told them, Peter got upset. You know, you, you can't do that, Jesus. And he said, get behind me, Satan. So Jesus told them prior to this happening, Jesus transfigured himself before it, six weeks before it happened, but yet they didn't have the ability to believe his words because he didn't have the grace yet. And so that's why after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit still hadn't come upon them in the fullness of the manner in which God was going to give it at Pentecost. And so they were still very slow to believe, all of them, right? I mean, that when Jesus first appeared, Luke, the Gospel of Luke says when they first appeared, when he first appeared in the upper room, they thought he was a ghost. They were startled. And so it took them time to grow. And even at the ascension, after he had been with them for 40 days in his resurrected glory, even after 40 days, before he ascended into heaven, it said, um, like, they, they worshiped him, but they doubted. And so this helps us to appreciate the fragility of faith, the fragility of believing God and believing what he says. Because this is what we are praying today about, praying for people who don't believe, for whatever reason that is. They choose not to believe in God. They, they might believe that there is no God. They might not believe, or they might believe there is some kind of being up there, but they don't believe in the Christian God. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't um, believe even, let's say, for those who believe in the Christian God and Jesus, that Jesus is God, they might not believe everything that Jesus has revealed to us. They might not believe in his power to speak through his church. So our faith is very fragile. And as I hinted to in the beginning of this talk, faith is rooted in belief, and belief, the strength of belief, is rooted in the character of the person that we believe. And usually there are three things that allow us to trust someone so much that we believe them. Three characteristics that they usually possess. That, this is my opinion now. This is my opinion. Usually, they have to be, um, they have to have some kind of uh, ability, you know, believe ability. Um, let's say, for example, you, if you have a problem with your health, you're going to go to a doctor because they have the ability, the training to help you. You're not going to go to an auto mechanic, are you? No. You're going to go to a doctor because they are trained, they have the ability to help you. Now, we all know um, that doctors have a wide range of competency, don't they? I mean, that's, I'm, I haven't encountered, I haven't had to encounter that yet myself, but from what I've heard from other people, you know, some doctors, they can refer, refer to them as what? Begins with a Q, as quacks, right? Some, I mean, it's, well, I'm just saying, that's, you know, he's a quack, right? I mean, that's, that, that's just the kind of pejorative term that, that people use. So you have to have the ability to help someone. You have to show that you have the competency to help someone. And then if you have a two doctors, they're both right, qualified to help you. They both have similar competencies, but one is more compassionate and present when they deal with you, and one is more cold and impersonal. Which one are you going to go to? The warm and compassionate one that really cares about you. And so that third characteristic is goodness. They have to want to help you. So if you can find someone that has the ability to help you, that has the competency to help you, and that wants to help you, those are three characteristics that will allow you to trust them. And when you have that trust, then it makes it easier for you to listen to them and follow what they say. 
And so I'm going to propose that the reason why people don't believe um, mostly is because they don't trust. And, and, and I'll say, I'll throw this out, is that um, some of this, when we speak about people not trusting or not, not believing, some of this has to do with people not, like I said, believing in a, that there even is a God. Because they choose to trust in something that they can measure, right? It's called scientism. Those who think the only form of knowledge that is available to us is scientific knowledge, meaning like you know, empirical, sci empirical science, that which you can um, see, taste, touch, measure, all that stuff. And so if, since you can't see God, you can't really smell God or touch him, then, well, he must not exist. And there must be, you know, some other way. There must be something else, you know. So, th so they, put all their they put all their eggs, it's an Easter pun here, all their eggs in one basket, okay? And that's, and that's in what human reason can discover on a scientific basis. And so that's what we remember. But let me quickly run through, because I, I love studying this. Um, let's just kind of like, just briefly go through um, that this about science and those who base their unbelief in God and putting all their eggs in the scientific basket. Let me just say this, that our faith makes the study of this world really possible. And some might disagree with that, that's okay, but really, God wants us to study his creation, and God has equipped us with the ability to study his creation. It's awesome. God, God delights in the fact that he's given us an intellect and a will um, that has, and the desire, therefore, to go out and ponder his creation. And you know why? Because by pondering his creation, we see him reflected in it. And if we really study creation scientifically, we discover that creation has an incredible beauty and order to it. And we know that when we discover that, it's a reflection of the beauty and order and goodness of God. And it makes us rejoice. Like, I, I have more of a scientific bent because my, my dad's like an engineer, um, so I kind of have that bent in me. And so, I was, I'm, I'm good at math or, you know, better at math and better at science than I am in English. Um, so I did okay in school in that area. But I didn't really appreciate it. I didn't love studying it until now, like until I became really a priest. And, and I, I was able to look at creation through the eyes of faith. Like, why, like, like so I view it not as some just a bunch of rocks or you know, a bunch of, you know, goo, you know, flesh or whatever, but I see it as God's creation. And I try to see in it, wow, God, let me see how you designed this, how you designed this body or how you designed this planet or this solar system or, you know, the, the billions of galaxies in the universe. You know, let, let me appreciate the hugeness of your universe because it reflects your bigness or again, the design, because it reflects your wisdom. And so I, I love studying science, and, and faith really does foster the study of science. There is no contradiction between faith and reason. Faith is just, faith is just um, God's light that gives us a bigger picture of, of, of everything, because again, empirical science can't tell us the why. Empirical science tells us kind of that something is there and how it's put together, but it can't tell us why. Why is it there? That's the realm of like philosophy and ultimately theology. And so my faith gives me a bigger vision of the picture. That's the role of faith. But it doesn't go against what our human reason tells us, the light of our human reason tells us through the study of the world because God is the author of both truths. You see, faith and reason go together. And so, you know, 
um, just because you have faith. And scientists, people who are into scientism, who are atheists, can tend to think that people of faith are just dodo birds. You know, you're dumb. But really, in actuality, if you look at the history of science, you'll find out that many of the brilliant scientists were Catholic or Christian, right? The person who helped to pioneer the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest, Father George Lemaitre. And the Big Bang Theory actually helps to support the idea that there was a beginning in time and it brings it all the way back to a moment, they call it a singularity, a moment where there's something, but, you, but that's as far as they can go. And so it kind of like brings you to that edge where it says, well, there must have been someone who started the bang, who created the bang, God, right? They can't tell how the bang, how the bang, or who did, you know, what, what, what motivated the bang. So anyway, if you go through and you study science, you really see that there is intelligent design. And um, even like Stephen Hawking acknowledged that, yeah, there's a, there's a design in the universe. But instead of going to positing the, the existence of a, an intelligent designer, they, they come up with this other stuff, like this multiverse, like, well, there's billions, or there's all these different universes in our, you know, we're one universe among one universe, and so there, hap there would happen to be in the evolution evolutionary cycle that one universe would happen to just kind of happen to be all ordered and et cetera, et cetera. Because you know what's going on there? Usually people don't want to believe, so they rationalize, and they create another reality that satisfies their disordered desires to not want to surrender to God. That's really what's going on. So anyway, um, let's just, we, we, we lift up like the petition is today for this fourth day of our Divine Mercy Novena. We lift up all those who do not believe in any fashion, whether they don't believe in God, whether they don't believe that Jesus is God, whether they don't believe that everything that God has revealed or speaks to uh, to us in our church, because there's a lot of those, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of those types, a lot of those politicians who don't believe everything that the church teaches, right? So, um, so we pray for all those who don't believe because for whatever reason, but we pray in God's mercy that he will um, help them to have a desire and a hunger for the truth, and that truth will lead them to a deeper surrender to the source of all truth. And as they pursue that and surrender their life to that truth, that they will truly be set free of the confines that they have placed themselves in, in their unbelief. Let's begin our Divine Mercy Chaplet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You expire, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O fount of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the
mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For 
the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and
God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us, that in difficult moments despair nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. A prayer for divine mercy. O great and merciful God, infinite goodness, today all mankind calls out from the abyss of its misery to your mercy, to your compassion, O God. And it is with its mighty voice of misery that it cries out, Gracious God, do not reject the prayer of this earth's exiles. O Lord, goodness beyond our understanding, who are acquainted with our misery through and through, and know that by our own power we cannot ascend to you. We implore you, anticipate us with your grace, and keep on increasing your mercy in us, that we may faithfully do your holy will all through our life and at death's hour. Let the omnipotence of your mercy shield us from the darts of our salvation's enemies, that we may with confidence as your children await your final coming, that day known to you alone. And we expect to obtain everything promised us by Jesus in spite of all our wretchedness. For Jesus is our hope. Through his merciful heart, as through an open gate, we pass through to heaven. Amen. of this sacrament of your body and blood. Help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever.
Blessed be God. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. May the heart of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even until the end of time. Amen. The results of my anthropological studies of the two faces from both images show a complete convergence with such characteristic facial points as the middle part of the eyebrows, the base of the nose, the cheekbones, jaws, the wings of the nose, the beginning of the upper and lower lip, and chin. It's worth analyzing the same details by observing the images in three dimensions. It is a face model created by Professor Mignaro in 2002, based on the measurements of the Shroud of Turin and the Veil from Oviedo. The Veil of Oviedo is the object that covered the face of Jesus when the body was still hanging on the cross, and this veil remained there on the face until the body was placed on the shroud. Then the veil was removed and the body was covered with the shroud. Traces of blood on the shroud and veil give us full information of how the face of Jesus looked like. I put all three images on each other, and it turned out that the eight points determining the most characteristic features of the face perfectly matched. 